We're now looking at the epidermis in more detail. So let's start off with the basement membrane zone. And here we have the basement membrane zone. This is the dermis below and the epidermis will be above. And we said that the epidermis is primarily a cellular layer. And the most common type of cell in the epidermis is called a keratinocyte. A keratinocyte. And they're called keratinocytes because later on, as we're going to see, they produce a lot of the horny, hard protein called keratin. But when they're first formed, they don't contain keratin. They first form down here in the basal layer. And they're cuboidal to columnar in shape. So here we have the keratinocytes on the basement membrane zone. And these keratinocytes are mitotically active from time to time. They will mitotically divide, producing two daughter cells. That's why this basement layer is sometimes called the germinative layer. It's actually called the stratum basale, the basal stratum. And it's going to follow round the basement membrane zone. So there are, there are these keratinocytes in the stratum basale, in the basement, just above the basement membrane. But there's other cells here as well. There's another type of cell that you get here called a melanocyte. Now the melanocytes have kind of sort of wavy arms like this. They're, they're called dendritic cells. And what the melanocytes do is the melanocytes produce melanin. Now, what colour you are is determined by the melanin in your skin. So I'm a bit white, so my melanocytes actually don't produce much melanin. Unless I go in the sun, in which case I'll gradually brown off a little bit, because my melanocytes will start producing melanin. The melanocytes are the cells, the melanin is the pigment they produce. But if you're black, your melanocytes are producing black pigment. If you're brown, your melanocytes are producing brown pigment. So whatever skin colour you have, it's because the melanocytes are producing melanin, the pigment of that colour. And this, of course, is completely genetically controlled. It's controlled by the genes that give rise to the melanocytes. And then here next to the melanocyte, we've got another, another uh, keratinocyte as well. Now, as well as that, in the basal zone, in the stratum basale, there are other types of cells, not many of them, but they're called Merkel cells. Merkel cells. So here we have a uh, Merkel cell. And these Merkel cells are actually sensory detectors. They will detect light touch. So if you just brush the surface of the skin, the reason you can feel that is because that's detected by these Merkel cells detecting light touch and sensation. And because they're sensory cells, obviously they need to have a sensory nerve associated with them. So just below the epidermis, in close contact to the Merkel cell, we've got these structures called Merkel discs. And these are connected up to a nerve fibre. So what happens is when there's light touch, that's detected by the Merkel cell. And the combination of the Merkel cell 
and the Merkel cell disc generates a new nerve impulse. So the mechanical effect of the touch causes the Merkel cell and the Merkel cell disc to generate a new nerve impulse and that then goes off in this sensory neuron eventually to the brain where it's experienced as sensation. It's one of the aspects of tactility. So we've got keratinocytes dividing, we've got Merkel cells and we've got melanocytes producing the pigments. And here we've got other keratinocytes as well lining the basement membrane zone. And actually some of the keratinocytes are what we call stem cells. So from time to time one of the keratinocyte stem cells will divide and produce two cells. One will stay as a stem cell, waiting for next time, but the other keratinocyte that's produced will divide into two. Each of those will divide again, so you've got four. They'll divide again, so you've got eight. They'll divide again, so you've got 16, and that will produce a small population of new keratinocytes. So more keratinocytes are dividing. And we already know that the nutrients and the oxygen for these metabolic processes are diffusing from the dermis below, from the tissue fluids of the dermis. So the oxygen for this is diffusing from the tissue fluids of the dermis. The nutrients, for example, that's glucose, C6H12O6 is diffusing from the tissue fluids of the dermis into the keratinocytes of the epidermis. The amino acids that are required the amino acids you remember are the building blocks for protein these have to diffuse through as well. And then the waste products are going to diffuse from the cells of the epidermis back into the dermis. So for example the waste product, carbon dioxide, is going to diffuse that way. Nitrogen containing waste products as a result of protein metabolism are going to diffuse from the epidermis back into the dermis. Now as these cells are dividing, I think you can see that if new cells are being produced as a result of mitosis in the stratum basale, in the basement layer here, then as new cells are produced, there's not going to be enough space. So what happens is older cells are going to be pushed up. So the older cells are going to be pushed up away from the basement membrane. And I think you can already start to see now we're going to get layers of cells, we're going to get strata. Now, inside these cells, the young keratinocytes, there are filaments of protein called tonofilaments. So there's tonofilaments. It's part of what you call the cytoskeleton of the cell. Inside cells, you have networks of proteins. And they're particularly pronounced. The cytoskeleton in the keratinocytes is particularly pronounced and we have these tonofilaments here. So if we looked at that under larger magnification, imagine this is a keratinocyte here, we'd see that it contains tonofilaments. Filaments of protein inside the individual keratinocytes. And here we have an adjacent cell also containing tonofilaments. 
And connected to the tonofilaments, we have other protein structures that join cells to cells. And these are called desmosomes. So the tonofilaments are intracellular. They're inside the cell. And the desmosomes are intercellular. They are between the cells. So here we have uh, desmosomes. The desmosomes are connected to the tonofilaments. Well, there's tonofilaments and desmosomes connecting them. And then we have another cell. We have another cell beneath that, maybe there. And again, this cell is going to contain tonofilaments inside of protein. And that's going to be connected to the other cells via desmosomes. So what we have is all of these cells are going to be in connect, interconnected by these uh, desmosomes. The cells are all interconnected. And this is very important because it gives the epidermis a lot of strength. You can't pull these cells apart because every other cell is connected to every other cell or it's all its neighbour cells by these desmosomes. But also it's very important that skin is flexible. For example, over your knuckles, you need the skin to be able to stretch or over the elbows, you need to be able to stretch. So what we need is a combination of strength and flexibility. And that's exactly what these desmosomes provide. They hold it all together, but they're also very strong, holding the whole thing together. Now, we've mentioned that there's keratinocytes, melanocytes and Merkel cells. There's a fourth type of cell in the epidermis, and it's an immune cell, and it's called a dendritic cell. And again, it's kind of got long arms like this that spread out. It's got dendrites that spread out. And we'll just call these dendritic cells. Actually, what they are, they are a specialised form of monocyte. So in the blood you have monocytes, but monocytes migrate into the tissues. And in the tissues, a monocyte can either differentiate into a big cell called a macrophage, which is phagocytic, or alternatively, given particular sets of signals, the monocyte can differentiate into a dendritic cell. And these dendritic cells are called antigen presenting cells. So if any viruses or bacteria get into the skin, they're going to be detected by these dendritic cells. These dendritic cells will then move off into the lymphatics, activating a specific immune response. So these are the gatekeepers, really, the immune cells that any bacteria or virus might first come into contact with. But most of the space is filled up with these um, keratinocytes here of different shapes. We have this layer of keratinocytes. These cells are still alive. As they get further away from the dermis, they are getting less oxygen, so they become metabolically less active, but they're actually still alive. And what people noticed, actually, when they prepared specimens of the epidermis, they actually noticed that these cells were spiny or thorn-like. So this layer is called the stratum spinosum, the thorn-like layer. So we have the stratum basale at the bottom, and then this next layer up, the stratum spinosum, the thorn-like layer. Actually, in life, it doesn't look very thorny. It's more when you prepare specimens that it starts looking thorny. Because the thorn-like appearances are caused by the, uh, by the tonofilaments and the desmosomes connecting the whole thing together. 
So there we've got lots of desmosomes connecting this all up nicely, giving great strength but flexibility. So dermis stratum basale with the mitotic keratinocytes, melanocytes and Merkel cells. Stratum spinosum, the spinosum here, the cells still containing the tonofilaments and held together by the desmosomes. Interlinked protein structures holding all this together. Now, as we get further away from the nutrient supply in the dermis, it gets harder and harder for these cells to survive. And as well as that, when we get to the next layer above, which is called the stratum granulosum, these cells start dying. And it's quite deliberate. There's a process of what's called apoptosis. Now, apoptosis means programmed cell death. So in apoptosis, cells are dying, not because there's something wrong, but because they've been ordered to commit suicide. So apoptosis is cell suicide. So these cells start dying. And also as they die, they're going to become flatter, partly because they're dying, but also because there's pressure from above that's going to flatten them. So above the spinosum, above the spiny layer of cells, we're going to have another layer of cells called the stratum granulosum, where the cells are flatter. Now granulosum actually means little grains or little granules. Let's just draw some cells first and we'll tell you why it's called that. Why it's called the stratum granulosum. So here's the cells now that have become a bit flattened out. As the cells die, the nuclei become less distinct. And there's little granules that are apparent in them. Hence the name stratum granulosum. Now these granules are dark staining granules and they contain a substance called keratohyalin. Keratohyalin. Now what keratohyalin does is it converts the proteins from the tonofilaments inside the cells. It converts the proteins from the tonofilaments into another type of protein called keratin. So in this layer, the granular layer, the stratum granulosum, there are little granules. The little granules contain keratohyalin. The keratohyalin is an enzyme that converts the proteins in the tonofilaments into keratin. So this layer is becoming progressively keratinized. That means the cells are becoming harder because we're getting nearer to the surface of the body where we want a nice hard layer to protect us against infection. And also at this layer, there are other granules visible in the cell called lamella granules. And the lamella granules secrete lipids. And what these lipids do is the lipids fill up the spaces between the cells. So here we have the cells, they're now secreting these lipids and this fills up the spaces in between the cells. It's a bit like the cement in a brick wall. The cells would be the bricks and this secreted lipid medium, the cement, holding the bricks together. So at this level, the cells aren't held together anymore by the desmosomes, but they secrete this nice, sticky, thick, fatty lipid material that holds them all together. So the apoptosis means the cells die off, keratin is generated, 
inside the cells, meaning the cells are becoming more keratinized, and lipids are secreted, holding the cells together. So again, we have good cohesiveness of the epidermis. It's not falling to bits, it's all nicely held together, which is good. And also, fats are going to be hydrophobic. Fats and water don't mix. So if water gets onto the surface here, it's not going to be able to get through. That's why your skin doesn't leak. And the water down here can't get out and evaporate because there's a waterproof layer. So skin is waterproof because of these secreted lipids. Stopping water getting in and stopping water getting out. And one of these lipids is called dehydrocholesterol. Dehydrocholesterol. And the lipid, dehydrocholesterol, when it's exposed to ultraviolet light, some of it will be converted into vitamin D. So when the skin is exposed to ultraviolet light, the ultraviolet light acts on the dehydrocholesterol. That produces vitamin D. This is where most of the vitamin D comes from. Vitamin D, there's not much vitamin D in the diet actually. Most comes from dehydrocholesterol as it's acted on by ultraviolet light. This early form of vitamin D will then be absorbed into the body and in the liver, but mostly in the kidneys, it will be converted into the active form of vitamin D called calcitrol, which is the active form of vitamin D. But the process starts off with the effect of the ultraviolet light on these lipids, particularly the dehydrocholesterol. So we've got three layers now. We've got the stratum basale, the stratum spinosum, and the stratum granulosum. Now, in thick layers of the skin, such as on the palms of the hands, where there's a lot of potential abrasion, the soles of the feet and the fingernails, the skin there is a bit thicker than other parts of the body, it's called thick skin. And in thick skin, there's an additional layer which is not present on thin skin. So there's an additional layer present on the hands and the feet, which is not present, for example, on the face where the skin is thinner. And this is called the stratum lucidium. Lucidium means lucid, the cells are clear. So this layer, it's a clear layer, there's flattened dead cells, like this. Again, still held together by the lipid extracellular matrix, holding them all together, making them waterproof. But it's a transparent layer, or at least it's a lucid layer. The stratum lucidium. So we've got the stratum basale, the stratum spinosum, the stratum granulosum with the granules, then in thicker skin, this thin layer of stratum lucidium. Now by the time we get to the outer layers, the cells are going to be very keratinized, heavily keratinized cells. So what we have is lots of very flat now, they're now squamous cells, quite a lot of layers of this, very flat cells, many layers, very rich in keratin, dry, hard, horny protein. Again, the lipid material is still filling up the gaps between them, keeping them waterproof, holding them together. So there's still this lipid matrix holding it together like the cement but the cells themselves now are dead flattened hard and highly keratinized the nucleus is no longer apparent in fact it hasn't been for a few layers really because these cells have been dead for some time now heavily keratinized and this outer layer is called the stratum 
corneum. The corneum is the outer layer. Stratum corneum, dead, keratinized, horny cells, quite a thick layer. And then as the cells get to the surface, eventually they're just going to slough off and be lost. They'll float away. So maybe sometimes when you towel yourself down after having a bath, you can see bits of white skin coming off the surface. Or if you run your finger along your mantelpiece, there's dust. Most of that dust is actually sloughed off human skin cells. S cells rich in keratin sloughed off the surface of the stratum corneum, the outside horny layer. Now, this whole process from the basal layer till when a cell is sloughed off doesn't take that long. You see different values quoted, but in young people it's probably four or five weeks, in older people it's probably six, seven or eight weeks. But it's not more than eight weeks. So when I look in the mirror in the morning, I can reassure myself with the idea that the skin I'm looking at is no more than two months old. It's constantly replaced, it's constantly regenerated as the cells divide at the bottom are pushed up through these layers and eventually sloughed off at the top. This is the nature of the epidermis. And it's really very clever because if some of this top layer is lost, these cells at the bottom seem to know there's an epidermal growth factor. So if some of the cells at the top are lost, then the mitosis rate in the keratinocytes in the basal layer will increase meaning that the skin is regenerated more quickly. And as we've said, even if all this layer is lost, these keratinocytes can migrate up from deep dermal structures, such as hair follicles or sweat glands. And if there's constant abrasion to these surface layers, then calluses form, thick layers of skin that protect the skin and make it even more rugged than it was. So down here we have the dermis. This is the epidermis. Stratum basale, the basal layer. The spiny stratum spinosum. The granular stratum granulosum, where the keratin and the lipids are first produced. In thicker skin, the lucid layer, the stratum lucidium. And in all types of skin, the outer layer, the horny layer, the stratum corneum.